All right, everybody, welcome to an interview today with Mr. Joshua Daniel George. He has a great agency and also a nice personal brand on YouTube. So we'll be diving in a little bit more about how he's done this all. Joshua, thanks for coming on. Appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me. All right, awesome. So jumping right into it, you want to give us the elevator pitch of who you are and what you do? Yeah, sure, man. So uh, I run a social media marketing agency where we help meal delivery services get more sales uh, through Facebook advertising. Alongside that, I also have a sort of coaching business on the side where I teach aspiring agency owners and media buyers how to get clients and also get results for their own agencies. Awesome, sweet. I, I love the oh, meal sweet. delivery because it's so unique. Yeah, man, that's um, cause obviously we've, we've, we've talked about that, right? Like there's a lot of agencies out there that just do not have a niche or do not focus on like a specific part of the industry. And when we actually started to focus on meal delivery, it was just so much easier to get clients and to get calls booked because the messaging around our offer was unique to them. And more often, because we ask our clients, there's a few questions that we ask uh, potential clients on a call. One of them is, how often do you get pitched by other agencies? Just do our own research on how the industry is, is moving, what you know outreach methods are currently being used a lot, and also why on earth they accepted to, to take a call with us. And almost 100% of the time, they will say, if it's, if it's a, a call prospect, they will say the reason why we accepted this call is because you guys are tailored towards meal prep and meal delivery. Um, whereas all these other agencies that are trying to pitch us are just generic e-com agencies and don't really focus on a specific niche. That doesn't surprise me. And I love to hear it. So one, one question I have then is obviously you've had an agency for a while. How did it go from when you first started to eventually ending up in that niche? Yeah, uh, good question. So there's, there's been a lot of transitions to be fair. I've been, uh, I've been doing social media marketing since 2017. Um, so I've been doing this for a while. And back then I had a business partner, uh, Bradley Riley, which I'm sure quite a few people uh, will already know. And back then we actually did everything through Upway. So what we would do, we would both, uh, both um, just be on the Upway platform, sending out proposals. And then as soon as we'd get um, someone that accepted the call with us, either me or Bradley would take it. And then from that point onwards, we would try and find a media buyer to outsource the work to. So we were both sort of working on the front end and then on the back end, we try and you know, get someone for as, as cheap as possible uh, to, to try and get them results. And there was two reasons why that didn't really work. Number one is because both Bradley and I are quite introverted people that do not like sales calls. Um, and number two, the people that we were outsourcing it to did not really get the results that the clients wanted. And this was back in, like I said, 2017, 2018, you could sort of get away with not getting the best results. It wasn't as competitive as, as it is now. But at the end of the day, the only reason why a client will keep paying you that monthly retainer is if they see some kind of return. What the issue that we had was we did not understand Facebook ads. So when we were on, again, we used Upway to find media buyers as well. We just did everything through Upway. Um, when they were, so when we were like looking through proposals of media buyers, we had no idea what was good or what was not. So they'd send us a proposal saying, oh yeah, we managed to get this client's 1,200 page likes. And we're like, okay, well, that's 1,200 more than they had previously, right? So they must be good at what they do. Not knowing that it makes no sense whatsoever, you know, how many page likes you've got. So we'd hire people based off of their portfolio, just assuming that, okay, it looks impressive. So they must be, you know, they must know what to do. And, um, and of course, also with the mindset of, um, cheaper like the price point doesn't really make a difference in terms of quality because these people are from third world countries therefore you know they're earning a full-time wage and you know they must be good which was not the case so after a while we realized okay we're both people that um, are fairly introverted that like to work on the back end but are placed on the front end and then our back end is absolutely dreadful so we basically end up um, every month just trying to get in as many clients as possible because we knew that at least three clients would leave every single month. And um, so it's just this vicious cycle over and over again. So um, after a while, we, we parted ways as, as friends um, and I was still trying to do the same structure, but then on my own. So um, 
I'll do the sales call and then basically try and find someone that could do the media buying for me. And through a mutual friend of mine, um, I actually managed to get the biggest client that I've ever signed, which was a 10,000 euro retainer plus 15% oh, wow. of um, the convey, you know, like the page conversion value, basically. Um, and the guy who we got the deal through basically said, I need a media buyer to help me with this because he sort of also ran an agency. So we partnered up and then we tried to get results for, the, for this client because knowing that, you know, 15% of the revenue on the back end, which was completely new for me, I always, uh, back then I used to always do the, the set retainer. So we got that client. Um, we wanted to expand, you know, sort of our team fairly quickly so that we could sort of work on the business, not in the business. That was the, the mindset back then. Um, but quite quickly realized, okay, we do actually really need to get results for this business because if not, they're just going to walk away like every other client did at the time. So that is when I actually started to go into the trenches myself and, you know, start to teach myself Facebook ads and media buying. And I realized that it wasn't actually as difficult as I thought. You just need to take some time to realize like, what is it that I'm actually doing? You know, where are these people going to? What does, you know, the, the, the flow of traffic look like, et cetera. Um, and then from that point on, but once I finally understood uh, like the Facebook ad side of things, like my agency just took off. I was getting good results for my clients um, and the clients that I had um, or the clients that would come in, they would stay as well. Whereas I'm, I was almost used to clients only staying for one or two months and then clients started staying for like three, four, five, six months on end. Um, so whereas usually I would be trying to replace as many clients as possible, I no longer had to. And it just made my made my agency much less stressful, much easier to manage. And I also didn't need to focus that much on the front end anymore because I knew, okay, if a client comes, if, if, even if it's just one client a month, that client's going to stay for a very long time. So it doesn't necessarily have to be, oh, I need to sign six, seven clients this month to replace all the previous ones. So from that point onwards, um, I just really focused on getting results for the clients. And then I got um, a sales guy on board, which is actually my cousin, who still works for me to this day. Um, so he now does all of the sales calls. And then I just focus on the back end. And like I said, the main focus at the moment with the agency is to get the client's results, make it profitable for the client, so that we can basically increase that lifetime value of the client. That's that's awesome. I think that you're focused on retention. I mean, I, I I smile hearing that because one of the most common things I see is people just get caught up in outreach. And obviously, I, I do. That's where I teach outreach. It's so important. Yeah. But if you're always churning, you just can't grow. Like I look at the agencies that I work with that are best. We're talking like ten mil a year above. They're really good at retention and they're really good at acquisition, right? Yeah. And then the I will say if I would rather an agency be good at retention than acquisition. Because yeah. anybody can scrape by one client every couple of months. If you can mm -hmm. actually keep them for a year, it'll pile up. Or even if you're great at acquisition, getting two, three clients a month, if they're only sticking around for a little bit, you're not only, you know, you never really grow, you just maintain, but also you just get really burnt out. You know, yeah. how, how much easier is it to build, like mention that one client, 10,000 a month, which holy crap, that's a massive retainer uh, versus yeah. having 10, $1,000 clients that, you know, churn, every couple of months. Yeah, exactly, man. And now, um, cause obviously a lot of agencies still do the, oh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll pitch them a thousand euros or a thousand dollars a month. And then we'll, we'll pitch them this 90 day accelerator program where we're going to get them results within 90 days. Um, but what we've actually started doing and what I also teach sort of in my coaching program is that you don't necessarily need to focus that much on the front end retainer. If you're focused on getting your client results, if you set up back end deals, you'll actually make much more because of that. So let's say you do have the aspirations to be a seven figure agency or anything like that. If you break that down, that's eighty three thousand dollars of euros a month. If you just focus on that front end retainer, that means on average you'll need. Let's say if you have a thousand dollar retainer, that's eighty three clients you need to manage on a monthly basis. Yeah. Whereas if you also have a back end deal in place and you do have a couple of clients that spend a lot, get great results, then you might only, I know agencies that are doing seven figures a year, but only have like 14 clients. And it's because 
they're spending so much and they've got an incredible back end deal because they're able to, you know, to, to scale these clients, they're in a, in a lot of money because of that as well. So by getting good results, you'll earn more money. Um, you'll also get better referrals, which is probably the easiest way to get clients is by having another client right. refer you on. And uh, yeah, like you said, you don't need to be focused on, on outreach as much, even if it's just one client every few months, as long as your current clientele stays stable, you'll just grow slowly, but surely. Yeah. And one question I have for you. So I'm not a, I'm not an e-com guy. You know, I've, I've, I've flirted with it a little bit, but I'm not an expert. It seems like everybody has a hard time tracking performance deals. So I'm curious, how do you track performance deals? So that it's not a, you know, point of conflict with the client. Yeah. So one thing I would recommend to everyone, if you are doing a performance deal, you need to make sure that you have some kind of third party tracking or, you know, at least understand Facebook's landscape now with the attribution window, um, you know, all of the post iOS 14 policies, et cetera. Um, but yeah, you will always have that ongoing discussion with clients like, okay, but Facebook ad, the Facebook ads manager saying this, but, you know, in Shopify or something like that, I can see a complete different number. What we actually do, and we're probably, we're almost shooting ourselves in the foot by doing so, but the performance deals that we now have is a percentage of spend because okay. how much they spend is just hard data. There's no ambiguity sure. there. Whereas previously we did the percentage of page conversion value, so the revenue generated through the ads, but then you just have that ongoing discussion every single time. Oh, but the ads manager says this much. On the back end, we can only see this much, et cetera. Um, and we noticed that, okay, because if, if obviously we always aim for a high ROAS. So if you spend 10,000 with a six ROAS, that's 60,000 generated. Um, if you're only taking a percentage of the ad spend, you will earn less. But in, again, in terms of longevity and maintaining the clients and stuff like that, I think a percentage of ad spend is probably the easiest way currently until Facebook sorts the stuff out with the, with the tracking. Looking at the big clients I work with, most of them do percentage of ad spend. So uh, yeah. that doesn't surprise me to do that. And um, I think it's the easiest you know, way to do it. Yeah, I, I'd imagine. So um, what, one question for you for retention is, do you bother to do like three month or six month contracts or how, how do you manage that? Or are you just, you know, I'm curious to hear. Yeah. So what we actually do is we, we say to the clients, listen, we don't believe in long-term commitments. We want you to be happy. So if we're not getting you results, don't feel obliged to stick around. We say that at the start. So we basically say, we're putting our money where our, where our mouths are. You know, we're going to get you results. And if we don't get you the results, then by all means leave, um, which is a risk on our part. But because, like I said, I'm so focused on getting these clients' results. And, of course, we vet the clients that come in. So sure. um, we look at the conversion rates of the store. We look at how much they're willing to spend as well. We look at the average order value. Um, and we look at the profit margin percentage. If all those numbers add up and I'm confident that I can get them results fairly quickly, then we'll say, listen, it's just ongoing month to month. We do ask for a 30-day notice if they are willing to stop. Um, cause some clients will just like one day before the retainer will come out, we'll say, guys, we're moving this in house, um, to prevent that from happening. We do say, just give us a 30 day heads up. Um, but yeah, no 90 day programs, no six month contracts, not like that. It's all, uh, it's all month to month. Sweet. Well, that's cool to hear. Um, and if you don't mind me asking how, how many clients are you working with right now? So it's 21 ad accounts right now. Um, and then there's one client that actually owns two other, it's two separate businesses. So it's technically it's sure. two different clients, but it's the same owner. Okay, sweet. And do you do all the media buying or do you have a media buying team? Yeah, no. So I do, I do the whole, uh, whole backend. So my AMC wow. is, it's fairly lean, right? It's Elliot, my cousin who does all the sales on the front end. So outreach is, um, we have Facebook ads running for our own agency. We do a bit of email marketing as well. And um, we also have an appointment setter. Uh, and then, of course, we also have referrals. We, you know, we focus quite heavily on the referrals every single time. That's also a tip for anyone watching. Every time you get a good result for your clients, ask them for a referral. Just say, hey, listen, you know, I'm glad you're happy with the results so far. We've got the capacity to take on more. So if you know anyone that could benefit from our service, uh, feel free to let us know. More often than not, you don't even need to give them commission or a fair or fee or anything like that. They're just happy to pass on more business to you if you're getting good results, of course. Um, so yeah, that's the outreach. In terms of sales, everything is handled by one sales guy, Elliot. 
and then um, I do all of the back end. So I run all the other accounts, um, set up all the campaigns, etc. And then the reporting, which I know a lot of people also have questions about, we just do weekly Loom videos. We explain to them, okay, this is what's happened in the last seven days. Uh, this is what's happening. Oh, this is what we're going to do for the next week. Uh, and th these are the results that you can expect. So weekly video updates also done by Elliot, my sales guy. And then they also, the current clients also have a client family link, which you know they can use if they want or feel it's necessary to book a call. Um, so they can just you know book calls whenever. And then we have the weekly updates to keep them in the loop. And then, yeah, I just run all the back end. Hearing you manage all of it yourself is really impressive, but it brings up a good point that niche is important for outreach, but also yeah. you're doing the same thing for a lot of different people, or I'm sure you couldn't do it all yourself if it was a bunch of different niches and industries. So that, that's another really good point there. Yeah, hundred percent, man. Cause people quite often ask me like, how long does it take to manage 21 accounts? And so my, you know, current structure in terms of routine is I'll get up anywhere between half past six and half past seven. Um, I'm still playing around with what, what the ideal time to get up is. Um, and then I will start work at nine. So before that, I usually go for a morning walk, listen to a podcast, audio book, something like that, and just sort of slowly start my day. Nine o'clock is when I first look into the client's ad accounts. Um, and another reason why I do that is because if I check the accounts any earlier, in the US, it will still be the day before. So I can't really check yesterday's okay. results because the day hasn't ended yet. Um, but yeah, 9 a.m. I'll check the ad accounts. Usually I'll be completely finished going through all the accounts by noon. Um, and like you said, the reason for that is because it's all, um, I'd say 80% is one niche, which is meal prep. So meal delivery clients on Shopify, all doing similar amounts of revenue as well. Um, so once you figure out what works for one client, because all of these clients are in different states as well, we don't take on... Uh, the same so we don't take on a competitor in the same state just out of principle and because we're sort of we'll be competing against ourselves so because it's all different states if something works for one client we can just duplicate it over all the accounts and we'll get you know very similar results same goes for testing out different audiences same goes for testing out different creatives everything will work to some capacity with other clients as well which makes it much easier to manage that many accounts whereas like you said if it's all different businesses, all different price points, all different niches with a, a different average order value, it will be you know, a lot of time and a lot of extra yeah, effort messy. to get the results. Yeah, man. Uh, one other question on your service delivery. Do you offer a guarantee? The reason I say this, I see a lot of beginners start their agencies and they're competing on price with a ridiculous guarantee and then they're struggling with acquisition. So it's like everything's against them. They're, they're fighting to get meetings for then underselling on price for over promising it's just a recipe for disaster I, and i know that guarantees can be done well um but yeah. also it's obviously a risk too i'm curious what your thoughts are with them yeah it's funny you should say that actually because that is something that we're currently playing around with the reason why i used to be against the guarantee is because it does attract the wrong type of clientele in my opinion so you will get people that will just take us on for the guarantee not necessarily because they want to invest into their business. It's like a, a different type of mindset, which is also sure. why I don't recommend people going purely for, in terms of e-com, purely for the back-end deal. Always have some kind of front-end deal in place, at least in my opinion, so that the client also has skin in the game. Because if it's just if it, if you just get a percentage of revenue or a percentage of spend, um, and there's, there's no front-end retainer, they will not be as motivated to provide you with creatives, to provide you with you know the content etc um and then yeah in terms of the guarantee you know previously i was like okay well if i'm going to offer them a guarantee they will not be as incentivized to make this work as much because they know if it doesn't work they just get the money back whereas now um again because we're so results focused we are playing around with if they if so what we do is we ask them what their profit margin is on average and then we will sort of set a KPI in terms of ROAS. So if they have, to keep things easy, a 30% um, a, a profit margin, then that means they need to get at least a 3.3 ROAS to break even. We'll say, okay, well, we're going to aim for a ROAS of four for the first month. If we do not hit that, then you do not pay us for the second month. So we, do not, we don't refund them, but we just wait for free for an extra month until okay. we hit the numbers that you want to hit. 
that's what we're currently playing around with. If it would work or not in the long term, that's you know obviously what we're going to find out. But yeah, that's uh, that's our standpoint at the moment in terms of guarantees. Yeah, I, I like that a bit better than we guarantee to double your revenue. Some, some of the things I've seen have been crazy, man. Like I've yeah, seen, like double revenue crazy. or yeah. Yeah. Okay. The well, frustrating thing with that is because a lot of e-com owners will get bombarded with emails on a daily basis, and then they'll see screenshots of you know incredible ROASs, um, you know, like like those big audacious guarantees. And because of that, obviously their whole perception of what's possible with media buying is slowly shifting as well. So if you say to a client, "Oh yeah, we'll we'll you know we'll get you a a ROAS that's above the break even point, and if um, we don't get that result, we'll wait for free in month two. That's not impressive to the to the clients because they're so used to seeing all these big audacious claims. Whether or not these agencies can actually fulfill that is obviously you know a story for another day, but. It is frustrating the way the industry is uh, is shifting in that way. Yeah, it, it makes it a lot harder, and uh, I, that's one thing. You know, I've even had a bad experience of offering too competitive of a guarantee at one point because it can get addictive too when you're closing a lot from it. Uh, yeah, but I I think the best clients don't need a guarantee, but it definitely can help attract um, in a competitive market. But again, it's you don't want it to be overwhelming, and so you're going to get the wrong kind of person. I mean, you mentioned doubling revenue. That's not going to attract a brand doing 100k a month, but you know that's BS. That's going to attract someone doing 2k a month. Exactly. Know? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. What we um one thing. So what I'd always recommend. So so the thing with with social media marketing is a lot of people they'll go for small brands because they'll actually think it's easier to convince an owner of a small brand to you know basically take their offer up. Um, the only issue is with a small brand is nothing is proven. So you'll have to do so much work and so much effort to figure out, you know, what audience to target, what creatives work, what is scalable and so on and so forth. Usually their website will be completely garbage as well because yeah. they'll still be on the free theme of Shopify. They don't have any plugins because plugins sometimes cost money. They don't want to invest into the business, et cetera. Whereas if you would put that same time and effort into an existing business that's already doing well, you know, you'll notice that the results will skyrocket because everything else is already proven. They already have a high converting store. They already have a decent average order value. They've got the social proof. Usually they'll have the creatives as well that already work. And then all you need to do is plug in all of those variables into the ads manager and run the campaigns and just manage, just basically just look at the analytics and make changes from there. And it'll be so much easier to get those client results. And yeah, like you said, big clients like that, will not go for the big audacious claims. But if you do get them in, you know, it'll be much easier for you to get them results. I, I like that mindset. I think it's be really bad with people who just got a course, especially, and they're trying to figure out what to do. So there's a lot of gold nuggets here. I um I, I have one question for you. It's a bit more personal. It, it's what is your goal to agency? So is the goal to have this something you grow for the next 10 years? Do you eventually want to hire it out, make it passive? Do you want to exit? Well, what's the long-term goal here? Yeah, that's it. it is a question that constantly changes. Like it's in terms of my answer, at least. When I first started, my goal was basically to just get two free clients, you know, to sort of replace a full time income and travel as much as I possibly can, sort of live that digital nomad lifestyle. Um, then obviously, when I signed that 10k a month client, my mindset shifted because <laughs> I saw the back end deal, I saw the front end deal. I was like, imagine having a couple of those clients. And then having that back end deal in place as well. So then I was like, okay, screw the whole digital nomad stuff. Let's actually build like a seven figure empire. Um, but I quickly sort of lost sight of the whole reason for me doing, you know, uh, social media marketing in the first place, which was for that freedom, you know, to have freedom of time, location freedom, uh, and financial freedom, of course, as well. So then I sort of went back from what on the seven figure agency to, okay, what is it actually that I want out of life? and then reverse engineer from there. And right now, it's not necessary to have a seven-figure business, but to just have, you know, a multi-six-figure business, but to have the freedom to do, you know, whatever I want, to be able to, like, you know, uh, do collaborations on YouTube without being stressed out that the ad accounts are failing and stuff like that. Um, so right now, if I can maintain what I've currently got, but then rather than having 21 clients, maybe have, like, 10 to 15 big clients, with juicy backend deals, but I'm sort of growing alongside them. And then just to be able to have the freedom to do 
you know, more things outside of, you know, sitting behind my, my, my desk, you know, in my office and to be able to travel more, et cetera. Um, so I've sort of gone back to like the previous mindset of when I just started. Um, but another thing I'm also really looking into right now is, is property and real estate and like other types of investments like that so that um, I can sort of make the money work for me uh, in, in a sense. So I currently have three properties in the UK that are on Airbnb. Well, these two are on Airbnb. One's almost um, almost ready. I still need to sign for that. And then once we have the keys, we can put that on Airbnb as well. Um, but yeah, that's basically the goal, at least right now, that's the end, uh, the end goal, um, is to have the agency with, you know, a couple of big clients with good back-end deals that can fund sort of my, uh, my real estate, uh, aspirations. That's awesome. I, I love to hear. I'll probably have a couple of personal questions for you on real estate. I just got into it recently. So that's cool to hear. Yeah. It's a, it's a, once you figure out, because it's see, the thing with real estate is it's it seems very intimidating until you realize how it works and how you can leverage like mortgages and the bank's money, etc. Sure. And then you realize it's it's not actually as difficult as people make out. It's just a mindset shift. You need when when people apply for mortgages, they're like, oh, that's a big loan, that's a big debt that I've currently got. But then when you have an asset like an apartment or an Airbnb that's basically covering that mortgage and also in a little bit on the side. You know, you're basically paying off property, which you keep as well. Because if you ever have an issue, you can just sell off the property and sure. you know, you're you back to square one. I want you sort of realize that. I want you to understand the game. It's it's not actually as intimidating as people make out. Well, sweet. Well, I really appreciate you coming on. This has been awesome. I'm going to share with a lot of guys who DM me on Instagram who are starting e com agencies. Um, lastly, where can people go if they want to learn more about you or want to work with you? Uh, I think YouTube is probably the best starting point. My YouTube channel is just at Joshua Daniel. Alongside that, I also have a Facebook group, uh, which is called the Digital Marketing Community. Um, so feel free to check that out. There's a bunch of free resources in there as well. So um, if you are a complete beginner that wants to get started with social media marketing, there's a few free trainings, free courses, et cetera, to help you get started so that you don't need to spend all your money on, uh, on all these courses. You can just uh, get started with, uh, with basic from zero. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming on. I'll have those links in the description. Hey, good stuff, man. I appreciate it.